Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of eCoffee with Experts. I am your host, Matt Fraser. And on today's show, I have with me a very special guest, Maya Morgan Wells. She is the director and host of the Marketing Hero podcast. And she has a bachelor's degree in business from the University of Colorado, a master's degree in sociology, and a doctorate in philosophy, all from UCLA. She is a digital marketing veteran with over 15 years of experience working with coaches, teachers, entrepreneurs, and small business owners to connect to connect with their purpose and build a business that not only generates revenue, but also makes a difference in the lives of others. She is an expert in content strategy and a word nerd who can't get enough of editing and writing good content. Her one-on-one coaching clients rave about her magic touch, earning her the nickname, The Content Doctor. When not hosting the Marketing Hero podcast, Maya enjoys spending time with her rambunctious, beautiful four-year-old daughter. Maya, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Hey, no problem. Hey, so how would your university professors describe you as a student? Oh, wow. That's such a great question to start out with because I've also (laughs) been a university professor myself. So I've seen it from both sides. Um, I think they would describe me as the most annoying engaged student possible. Um, and oh, I say yeah. annoying because sometimes you just want to go do your job, go home as a professor, right? But yeah. you've got this student asking you all kinds of questions and trying to form a relationship with you and trying to get deeper with things. And that was yeah. me. I was always a schmoozer. I was always trying to relationship build. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, and I'm the one that always gets the A on the assignment and always turns it in on time. Um, well, and awesome. so I think that in some ways that's a positive thing. And in some ways that can, as a professor, I think that tends to get annoying because you're like, okay, kid, settle down, just turn in your work. (laughs) (laughs) So have you seen, have you seen, you just mentioned you were both a student and a professor. Have you seen someone like yourself as a professor who was a student? I have a couple of times. And actually those are the students that I nominate for awards. Those are the students that I praise with other faculty. So I kind of joke a little bit about it being annoying because those types of students, you know, they're going to go far, you know, that they're going to be engaged in whatever they're doing. Um, And that relationship building aspect is always there with those great students and it helps you to remember them. So if anyone out there is in college and looking for a way to build your network and stand out, that's one of the mm-hmm. best things that you can do is, you know, ask questions and form relationships with your current professors. Yeah. Now, did your parents encourage you to go far in education? Because not, not everybody gets uh, a bachelor's, a master's and a doctorate uh, in, in different disciplines. I mean, it's, it's, I would use the word ambitious to describe you if I didn't know you. So, uh, but was, 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 um, for, that kind of education encouraged by your parents? Well, I'm going to get a little deep with you here on this one because it goes pretty deep. I am a first generation college student. So I was the first one in my immediate family to finish at least my bachelor's degree. Um, Shortly after that, my dad finished his bachelor's degree. So that was kind of a cool cool thing. He was going to night school when I was in high school. And I just knew as a young kid that education was going to be the way sort of out of the situation I had grown up in. Not that it was terrible by any means, but we didn't grow up with money. We didn't grow up with a family that was very educated. And so for me, I saw school, school was that one place where I could really shine. I could really, um, be somebody special. And so I think I got that in my mind as a really young kid. Um, even the little elementary school report cards, I would love it when it had all A's. I was that overachiever from the beginning. And the, the little part that goes, and I'll just say, you know, my parents, uh, bless their souls have been so encouraging with whatever I needed to do. They yeah. may not have known all the steps to take, you know, so I, I applied for college myself. I applied for financial aid myself and those types of things. And it made me a really resilient person to be able to explore those things on my own and mm-hmm. make those things to happen on my own. Um, and so, yeah, my, my dad always has said to me, you can do anything you put your mind to, you know, and, and I, that always sticks with me because he yeah. does truly believe that. Um, And then the the real short, deeper part that I want to tell you is that all of that achievement, um, achieving advanced degrees, doing those things, um, sometimes always doesn't come from the right motivation. And I'll speak for myself. Some of that didn't come from the right motivation because it was an act of proving. It was an act of proving Mm. my worth, proving myself. Mm. And as I've Mm. gotten older and now I've become a mother and I, you know, get a lot deeper on these things. It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, why, why did I really feel the need to prove myself to that level? You know, am I not worthy as a human being without all of that? So something interesting to think about, I think uh, with me, Mm -hmm. it was a little bit of all of that. It was a little bit of proving myself, proving my own worth, a little bit of impressing others. And then, you know, of course, on the other side, it was like really being interested in figuring out 
how sociology and the study of people and groups relates to something like marketing. We use yeah. sociology and everything that we do as marketers, which is what I am now. I'm a, I'm a writer yeah. and a marketer. And so that's kind of how those two things tie in together. So yes, of course, there was the academic exploration and really wanting to know the stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But there's that other hidden side that I think a lot of people don't talk about, which is being so ambitious, you know, because you want to prove your own worth, which is not always yeah. necessary. We're, you know, we're yeah. worthy human beings just as we are. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I suffered from the imposter syndrome. And probably not on post-secondary education, but investing in different courses and so on and so forth. I guess I include my degree in that. But yeah, I probably spent like more money than I even want to admit on camera Um, (laughs) in regards to education that, I mean, the only accreditation I have is a a diploma in web media design. But beyond that, you know, there's so many courses that I invested in. And and I look back and the same thing with you, it was because I had this huge insecurity about needing to prove that I knew what I was doing or didn't really believe I knew as much as I, I should know. And so, yeah, I th- right. thank you very much for, for sharing that. Um, much appreciated. I'm sure someone will, you know, it's, 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 it's very valuable to be able to hear other people talk about those things. Um, you know, do you, do you think the experience that you, you gained first at, uh, at we first branding has helped you in your development as a digital marketer and, and entrepreneur? Yeah, you know, that was uh, quite a long time ago. I think it was, I want to say 2012. So yeah, 10 years ago, Mm -hmm. I was involved in the launch of a New York Times bestselling book uh, about how social media can kind of change the world and and help big corporations to see the value in social, you know, corporate social responsibility and social Mm -hmm. initiatives because of the power of social media to share those things. And because of the power of us, you know, as consumers, because Mm -hmm. we have such a voice through social media, we can call out corporations or companies that we don't think are doing the right thing, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was an eye opener in terms of the power of social media beyond just Mm -hmm. posting cute pictures of yourself from Saturday night. You know, it it was, it was an eye opener toward what, what could really be done um, with social specifically. And Simon Mannering, who is the author of that book and the founder of We First, Branding mm-hmm. is an incredible writer. He's an incredible speaker, a person in general. And so just mm-hmm. learning from by watching him, learning by osmosis, um, how to present myself better, how to speak mm-hmm. better, um, mm-hmm. and those types of things. So even things beyond marketing itself, um, just having a mentor like that was super important early in my marketing career. That's awesome. Hey, the transition, like just now, not a lot of people would think that you would go from sociology and philosophy to to marketing, but I do because I'm a marketer and I understand that marketing is all about people and understanding people and understanding why they do what they do and so on. And we could talk about that forever, but what was the the link between that and doing marketing? For instance, um, were you just doing it as a side hustle while you were in school to pay the bills? I know some people have done that or, or what's the, what's the journey that happened between, between, you know, school and, and, you know, getting started in marketing. Well, It's a little bit of a, um, a layered journey because I did not go to graduate school right after undergrad. So I, I went to undergrad in Colorado. Um, and I, at that time really wanted to be in the music industry and, oh, I thought I was such a big fish in a small pond being in Denver, Colorado. And I needed to get myself out to LA as soon as possible. (laughs) Right. Like everyone needs to do that. Um, I, I laugh at it now because, you know, almost 20 years later, it's just kind of funny to me, but at the time. Um, yeah. Denver did not have as much going on as it does now and things like that as a cultural center. Uh, I mm-hmm. was very into music at the time. I had a radio mm-hmm. show in college. I worked for different record labels in the days where we actually had to pass out flyers at record stores. Mm-hmm. Both of the, both things don't even really exist anymore. Um, yeah. That was my very first start in marketing was um, working for record labels and promoting their, oh, okay. their releases You know, when I was in college. Um, mm-hmm. And so I graduated, I ended up getting a job at a music magazine in LA. So, oh boy, did I think I was cool. I you know, quit my, my job that I had then and, and moved right out to LA. And I spent about nine years in and around LA. Um, mm-hmm. At first I was in the music industry. I was, and this whole, the through line to all of this is writing. So that's kind of the point you can grab onto here is, sure. is writing. So I was writing music yeah. reviews, writing features about artists. And as part of that job, I kind of got pulled in as a marketing coordinator, a marketing assistant. They had a uh-huh. sister company at the magazine that was doing youth-oriented experiential marketing. 
um, oh. for brands like Scion, Reebok, Canon cameras. Yeah. And at the time, if you remember the early 2000s, Scion was like the big, cool, like car. Oh, right? yeah. And, and I yeah. oh, we were yeah. talking about dealerships earlier. So yeah. Scion was, um, you know, like the, the company that I work for there, it was an agency. They made like the emblem for the very first Scion, you know, the little S the emblem yeah. that was made by the agency I worked for. So that's where I started to really see marketing as a potential career alongside music. So I was doing a lot with like hip hop and Scion and like oh, yeah. hip hop and Reebok. Right. So you kind of see the cool. marriage of that. Yeah. And I was um, promotion director for a local radio station there after that job. And then I um, met a really big hip hop artist through that who needed a manager. And so then at that time, I managed a hip hop artist for a couple of years, all oh. of which is like pretty outside of what I do now. <laughs> but it was always kind of like, how do we do the brand partnerships and how do we get sponsorships yeah. for this event? Or what about the tour? And it, marketing is always kind of a part of it. Right. Um, yeah. And so as much as I loved music and I loved underground hip hop at the time and all of that, um, I started to kind of see that through line with marketing. And I started to actually really ask myself the question, why do advertising agencies or marketing agencies, want, you know, why does it work to align with like a culture, like underground hip hop, like Scion did, for yeah. example, or like, mm-hmm. why do these cultural connections work? Like Red Bull. Why do, as a, yeah, exactly. Like a Red Bull is doing this whole cultural phenomenon, which is just kind of starting it early sports. in my career at that time. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was partly that, and it was partly we were going into the Great Recession in 2008, which is right yeah. when I went into graduate school. And so Ooh. all the timing has kind of worked out in my career very well, which is great. Um, so I was already in marketing, and then I wanted to know more about why that connection works which yeah. to me is psychology, it's sociology. And yeah. so I got a master's degree and a PhD in sociology um, at UCLA. And it was just an amazing opportunity. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but in most PhD programs, when you get accepted, it's paid for. So I had that whole experience at UCLA was paid for, which was awesome. It was during a recession. Ooh, um, I didn't have to worry as much. Um, right yeah, so that was why actually when I was when I was looking into it, I was like, oh, should I get a master's degree? And then I kind of realized if you just stop at a master's, normally it's not paid for by the university that you you go to. So just a little quick tip on that. If you're going to go for master's, you might as well go for the PhD. Yeah. So I was thinking that I wanted to be a professor as we see in the movies. It's so glamorous to be this professor that walks into a big classroom and everyone's (laughs) listening to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Academia is not like that in real life. I mean, I did Mm. have some of those experiences teaching to a big lecture hall and stuff, which was awesome. And I Mm -hmm. love the interactions with students. You can mm-hmm. tell I like to talk. Um, I like mm-hmm. to have relationships. So that yeah. student aspect, I really liked. But as a researcher and as a professor, yeah. you that's only maybe 20% of your time in most cases. The yeah. rest of your time, you know, you're writing these research articles that no one ever reads. It's really hard to get them published. Um, and I got my first professorship offer and it was almost half of what I was making in the marketing world. So the money part of it and all of that, it just, yeah. and it was like to get a full-time professorship, you had to be open to moving anywhere. I mean, anywhere. And I was really stuck to California. I wanted to stay in California. Yeah. I was like, if I'm not getting a job at UCLA or USC or, you know, Loyola or something, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm into this academic stuff. Um, yeah. And so it was kind of that. And it was kind of like some feedback I got on my first couple of articles where it was the reviewers from these academic publications are, telling like two different reviewers were telling me the opposite thing about my research. Like yeah. you need more of this. So you need less of this. And I just was like, you know what? I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to stick with marketing. It, it's more of a real world, tangible yeah. life life. I think because academia you're, you're in many cases, in I'm not going to speak for everyone. I felt like you're, I was going to, I was going to be in a bubble and I wasn't going to be mm. really interacting and teaching students very much. And the mm. money sucked. I'm just going to be honest. Yeah. So, um, in that time, so I, I went ahead and finished the PhD, wrote the dissertation, did all of that great stuff. Um, and then, yeah, went, went into my first real digital marketing role back in 2015. And at that time was still on the agency side and started focusing in on software marketing and and content marketing and that is where i've really found myself and found my stride um as i yeah. mentioned i'm a writer yes. so content marketing is really a good fit for me because i can understand the customer what they might need what they might be feeling and all those kind of like psychological and socio sociological things 
And then, you know, marry that with the product or the service or whatever I'm trying to market and create a content program that's really going to connect with that person. And so that's kind of what I do now. Um, and it's great. I can work at home. I don't have to travel into a campus and, and be on campus all day teaching. Um, you know, there's positives and negatives. The job security is not the same as being a tenured professor, of course. Um, yeah. But, you know, my lifestyle is perfect for, for being a mama of a young kid and you know, mm-hmm. working at home and all of that. So, um, yeah, digital marketing is where I ended up. And I'm still a word nerd after all this time. Yeah. What do you love about it the most? That is a really good question. I think I think there's two competing things that I love the most about what I do now. One is the yeah. relationships. Um, the okay. really, like, speaking with people like you, right? Speaking with yeah. people that I work with, uh, mm-hmm. interviewing people for my podcast. Um, mm-hmm. And I do actually, outside the podcast, I work full-time as a content marketer um, inside of a software company. And so I am doing this stuff every single day as well as yeah. talking about it. And so mm-hmm. the relationships, I know that's kind of a trite thing to say, I guess it's other people, but there really no. is. It's it's talking yeah. to people, being with yeah. people, learning from others and having yeah. those relationships. Um, and then I guess sort of the secondary thing is writing. I still love writing. Yeah. So a lot of what I do um, in my current job is I assign content out to people and then I get to edit it. Um, but when I have a project like um, recently, uh, the company I work for updated their brand voice um, okay. from being kind of cor- corporate corporate speak into way more rebellious like you bet your Ooh. ass we're going to do some good marketing, like stuff like that. Uh, oh, so interesting. That's been really fun. That's been really fun. So like trans, translating the jargon, right? We we hear so much jargon in marketing. Um, yeah. Translating that jargon into just a conversation and into like just something more authentic and, and visceral and real. And that has been really fun. So I enjoy the writing part still. I enjoy the relationships and the writing. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, you know... There's so many directions I could go. I'm gonna thank you for me. Okay, so what do you is it also the impact that you can have? For instance, the I, I saw the work that I did impact an entire business and in impact uh in uh, uh, an entire an entire department of employees and 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 so on and so forth. So is it also like, like for instance, you write a, a piece of content that maybe gets ranked on Google or 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 um achieves the KPIs which which it was written for? Is that also another aspect of it? Like seeing the impact of what you can do and that that your work has on on a business and in people? Yeah, definitely. I think that that's a fun thing to see. I think it's hard to see. Oftentimes, yeah. individual impact, um, or even the impact of an entire content marketing program, for example. Yeah. And there's lots of reasons for that. You know, unclear reporting or unclear attribution um, yeah. of leads that come through. Uh, that type of stuff. It, it's kind of hard to see that impact in some ways. Um, I will say one project I did for Clear Pivot, which is an agency I, I worked for, they were really trying to get into the software and SaaS market a little bit more. They had been marketing for, you know, like medical device clients and different types of clients. Oh, yeah. And were wanting to make a significant push into SaaS. And so I had the pleasure of learning about and writing and creating um, a pillar page, which is kind of a content marketing concept um, yeah. you can go into in a minute if you want to but creating a pillar page on SaaS marketing and uh-huh. that still gets thousands of readers all the time. And when you look at the reporting, you can see the contacts that's bringing in the leads that it's bringing in for that agency. And it was something I wrote, I think two years ago, and it just keeps getting yeah. updated a little bit here and there for each year. And uh-huh. the reporting that we were able to get because it was marketing by the agency for the agency, there wasn't yeah. a ton of other, you know, constraints involved, departments mm-hmm. involved, people involved. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To, so that means that we can really see the results of, of what we're doing. So that, that's one example. I think that you can really see the results yeah. um, of something like that um, and writing that whole suite of content that then links into that big page yeah. it actually works. Um, and so, you know, yeah. that company is still getting page one results for um, SaaS marketing agency, for example, and which is mm-hmm. a great keyword for them to rank for. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I like seeing those. I like seeing the plan come to fruition and then work. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. will say that it's often hard to see that depending on yeah. other things that are involved, other departments that are involved in, and how the reporting comes out. Yeah, I hear you. I guess it was easier for me to see it because I was just working for a mom and pop. Sorry, I was working for a mom and pop dealership that 
didn't have anybody but me <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> to yeah. do the work. So, so you know, it's like, who else is doing it? Well, just me. <laughs> but you, yeah, you when you add a bunch uh, of layers on, yeah. yeah you, when, when you're yeah, adding layers, you, sometimes you can't exactly see yeah. that so clearly. But, but yeah, I mean, it is, I think it's the, the best place to see results and feel that feeling of like achievement or like yeah. satisfaction is in event marketing. And that's what I started out my career with was events. And oh, you yeah. mentioned Simon Mannering and, and we first branding, we did yeah. uh, like a, a branding seminar, basically for lack of a better word, and had huge attendees from like Coca-Cola sustainability and different stuff like that. Oh, and yeah. I put together the event itself, you know, hired all the vendors and, you know, all the stuff and yeah, did the yeah. venue. And I remember distinctly and gosh, this was 10 years ago. I still uh-huh. remember standing in the back of that room, you know, with my arms folded, just going, Wow. Yeah. Wow. Look at this. Like it's people are laughing. People are taking notes. Like they're engaged. Yeah. They're getting something out of it. And we pulled it off. You know, it's like yeah. that is a cool way to see the results of something that you're doing. Um, mm. in certain cases with content, it's not as apparent. Mm. Um, but yeah, do we love seeing the views on something we've written? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. No, that's awesome. Um, so you'd mentioned content pillar. Sorry, you'd mentioned pillar pages. Um, what is your process for, for developing pillar pages? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. This is one of my favorite things to talk about with content yeah, marketing. That's um, awesome. So if, if anyone is, is out there figuring out their next move for content strategy, this is a really good thing to try. And what it is, is you choose one thing that's very, very important to your company. So for that agency, I mentioned, they wanted to do SaaS marketing, right? Software as a service mm-hmm. marketing. That's like a good keyword. Um, maybe it's, you know, there's a certain keyword to do with your product, your service, or what your business does. Um, Mm -hmm. Right now, the company I work for is very focused on marketing for manufacturers. So one Mm -hmm. of the pillar pages is, you know, the ultimate guide to manufacturing marketing. So think about just one topic or one, you know, one audience, one topic, one keyword, basically, that you want to rank for. And make a huge page all about that. And they're oftentimes called the ultimate guide to, you know, the A to Z guide to something like that. Um, And it, it literally is everything somebody would need to know about that topic. Mm -hmm. um, Like almost like a masterclass in that topic. And basically it just is a huge long web page. And yeah. you need to have it linked in your navigation. That's the important thing. Link it okay. in the navigation um, yeah. and have it be a really clear URL, like something, something.com slash, you know, manufacturing dash marketing, like just very, very simple. Um, and yeah. there's all, there's reasons behind all of that. For those of you who are good with SEO, you want to have yeah. it in your URL. You want to have it in your heading, your header tags and your, yeah. all of that stuff, your site title. So um, you create this big, long page. And then you think about what are the specific topics around this general topic that I want to go deeper into. And oftentimes those are like subsections or paragraphs in your big, long, huge page that then yeah. become their own blog posts. So then okay. think about that as the center of a wheel. That's your that's your pillar page. And okay. then going around and the spokes on that wheel become your blog posts. You know, they yeah. could also be webinars. They could be podcast episodes, any other type of content around that. So let's take the example of, uh, manufacturing marketing, since we're kind of talking about that, sure. um, you're, you know, one blog post actually just wrote today, uh, earlier today as uh, manufacturing mm-hmm. marketing trends for 2023, yeah. right? So, okay. um, if somebody's searching manufacturing marketing trends, that could be a, a really great keyword, right? Or yeah. marketing automation for manufacturers. So each of those little topics becomes its own blog post. And then yeah. the key to this whole thing is actually linking those things to each other. So I know it sounds like so simple, like link the pillar page to the blog post and link the blog post to the pillar page um, and do it naturally. Just like in the text, find a word that's going to be, you know, hyperlinkable, right? Like you find the good phrase and then link that phrase out to that blog post. And what that does is it creates a content cluster um, that Google for lack of a better term, Google sees it better, right? So they're re- yeah. Google's algorithm is looking for a page with great authority. Like this page is telling me everything I need to know. It's linking out to other resources on the same domain. Those resources are, are linking to this. So you create this like ball of links. And I yeah. have found, at least with that SaaS marketing example, that is exactly what took us to page one. And it's exactly what took us to slot one on page one for that keyword. So I would yeah. highly recommend planning your content in clusters like that. And Absolutely. Then 
Um, yeah, so that's kind of that like pillar page concept is creating a cluster around that really important keyword that you want to get traffic for. Yeah, absolutely. And do you write the pillar page as, as like you mentioned something there about, you know, some of the paragraphs become their own uh, blog posts. So do you make sure that you keep those paragraphs like, for instance, because you could write, here's what I'm getting at. That paragraph you talked about could it also be the entire blog post, the entire article on the pillar page. So you purposefully mm-hmm. make sure that it's just a paragraph so that you can so that you can actually write the separate blog post on its own uh, to link to that pillar page on purpose. That's like the strategy question. behind um, it. Yeah, I mean, I think you could do it either way. I think if you okay. put the entirety of each topic in the pillar page, it's going to kind of start to mess with your user experience. Yeah, and you want that agreed. user to be able to get a lot of information, you know, but kind of have it be balanced. Um, yeah. Also beware of duplicate content. So if you're going to write three, four, five, 10 paragraphs about that topic in the pillar page, I mean, there's no rule against that, but you definitely don't want to just copy paste that out and create a blog post from it because it won't do you any good to have duplicate content. No, it won't at all. Yeah. I think if it were a choice, I would say, yeah, keep it short in the pillar page and then expand upon the topics that you can maybe entice people to click on that link. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, for internal linking, um, you know, it, it, th- doing it manually, that would be challenging, I would think. Uh, I know that there's a gentleman, I can't remember his name right now, but he came up with a, a WordPress plugin called Link Whisper that uh, actually allows you to s- do internal linking uh, pretty easily. Um, so just oh, throwing it out there for... That. Yeah, yeah, it's called Link Whisper. Yeah, because I, I do it manually. I actually... I usually, what, what I'll do is I'll create a spreadsheet. If your marketing automation tool or your content management system doesn't already have this, which some of them do, um, yeah. you can, there are tools for creating content clusters that are out there um, within certain marketing automation platforms. Oh, yeah. um, but what I do is, yeah, I just, I just have a spreadsheet that has like, okay, here's my 15 blog posts. You know, yeah. here's my ebook, here's my, my, you know, webinar replay, here's my podcast yeah. episode. And I just make sure I just even check them off. Like, okay, this is yeah. linked in there. That's linked in there. Okay, great. And then I make sure in each of those that they're all linking back to that same pillar page. Yeah, um, and then another absolutely. like side note that I think is really important on this pillar page idea is yeah. take that content that you've created, that long form content and yeah. make a downloadable PDF from it. You don't even have to yeah. make it different. Just take the content, give it to a design team put it in your template for your eBooks or whatever. And then at the very top of that pillar page, offer it as a download. You would be so surprised how many people will give you their email address to get the PDF of the same darn thing that's on that page already. Um, And that's actually where a lot of the leads came from that SaaS marketing pillar page that I did a couple of years ago is like legit, just that little email box, you know, you want this to get the PDF version. Yeah. And it's the same content. You don't even have to write new content. Just use that content to make a PDF. And that's a perfect lead gen machine right there because the page itself is bringing in organic searches. I mean, the the purpose of it is if it's working, it is, it's bringing in organic traffic. And then you're just immediately capturing that with a small form. I don't want 20 fields on this form. I want one field. Email that's address. Email address. That's, that's it. it. And then you could put them. Yeah. Then you put them in your nurture campaigns and you just go crazy yeah. from there. But yeah. Um, yeah. So the that's one important point for pillar pages is you also yeah. want to have some kind of chance on there for them to convert on something. And the easiest thing for them to convert on is the same topic just as a PDF. Yeah. And so that PDF is, is made prettier though with graphics and, and um, like you're not just taking the content and <laughs> creating a boring, uh, yeah, I mean, you're going like to have to design it. Talk or a, word, yeah. a word document that's just, you're, you're jazzing it up, right? Yeah, you're putting I, it I, into I your you design template. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're probably going to have some illustrations or some photos yeah. or something like that that's kind of taking you through it. And then I will say on that particular example, but really this is a tip for any pillar page, it shouldn't sure. just be a big old block of text. Put okay. in examples, put in screenshots from other companies and, and examples like oh, um, yeah. the one that I created, it has a photo or a GIF or even a video every few paragraphs. So that's really yeah. broken up. And it's, and yeah. also we're doing a lot of really practical tips right now. I want to get my notebook. Oh, out. absolutely. Um, you also want to have a, um, a clickable table of content maybe even on the sidebar that follows you down the page oh, so that yeah. you have the user has the opportunity to interact with the page. If you just dump 
like your Google doc onto a page and it's 10 pages of text, no images, yeah. no way of kind of clicking back and forth and interacting with it. Your bounce rate, you're gonna be girl, huge. that bounce rate is going to be super huge. So, you know, the time on page is going to be zero. So you want to yeah. give your audience, you know, a valuable resource. It's going to teach them something that they really want to know and make it really easy to navigate through the different sections, because not everybody needs to start with the very beginning. Like what is marketing? You know, like you may want to skip that. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're in this game, you already know that you want to know like some of the examples and some of the nuances and how do I go deeper and how do I use data better and that kind of stuff. Then you can just click to that section and you can skip all the other stuff. Um, Yeah. And then as many visuals as you can. So the one thing that does get lost in translation there, if you're doing it into a PDF is of course you can't, have, you know, video in that and and those type of things. So you will lose some of the interactivity. Um, but really I actually love to do a study sometime and ask of the PDFs that we download in those situations, how many of us ever pop them open and actually read them. And I'd be Mm -hmm. willing to bet not that many, but for us as marketers, I hate to say it, but we don't care if they read it. We just want to no, get their we email address want so their that email we can address. keep serving them. <laughs> yeah. And it's not a mean thing. It's not like we want your email address to spam you, but it's, we want your email address to show what value we can provide as yeah. whatever company it is, as a service provider, as a product creator, or whatever. Um, you know, that's an opportunity to continue to show value. Um, and Absolutely. you got to have the email address to do that. So that's, we really don't care how cool the ebook is, as long as it's cool enough yeah. to get the, the, the to get the email. Address. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Hey, what about, have you seen this strategy work? Um, like, uh, building a pillar page, like the ultimate guide to get the ultimate guide to renovating your kitchen and mm-hmm. then having the, the lead magnet be, uh, the renovation hiring guide checklist. Uh, seven mistakes to yeah. avoid before hiring a renovation contractor, kitchen renovation contractor. Have you seen? Uh, okay, if you ha- have you seen something like that work, and if not, do you think it's a viable idea? Yeah, well, I think that um, with the pillar strategy, that covers co- sort of one piece of your marketing program, um, which is organic traffic. You know, pulling people into that keyword and giving them an opportunity to convert making your site seem authoritative, all of that great stuff, right? Mm-hmm. But there's also um, you know, a need to move contacts down the funnel. So yeah. when I hear something like a checklist, I think of that as coming a little bit later um, okay. in you know, the email nurture program, for example, um, you, know, sure. you can offer that Hey, you know, it seems like you're getting really close. Like, you know, we all know about the customer journey, right? So as the customer is moving further down that journey and we want to qualify them for our sales teams, um, we want to see that they're actually, you know, moving down that journey. So a checklist is a really great thing to send at that point. Great. Um, A comparison, like I love comparison checklists, like go against your competition. Like, Hey, we're legit. We can show, we can show where, how we compare to the competition and why you should choose us. Right. So so if you're confident like that, you can do that. A comparison checklist. Um, one thing that worked really well, um, recently I am, I was mentioning, I I do work full-time at a software company. Um, one thing that worked really well for us recently was uh, a checklist to switching solutions. So it's a marketing automation software And most of the people who are advanced with marketing have some sort of marketing automation platform, right? Yeah. Um, So the customer that we're trying to go after with that type of a thing is we we call them disenfranchised. They may have like a Marketo, for example, and say, gosh, it's just always so hard to build in Marketo. Like, I feel like I need an expert opinion every time and, and things like that. Right. So they, those types of customers, when they come to act on, which is the company I work for now, um, we call them disenfranchised, like, oh, just working in this current platform. I just am so over it. I need something new. Yeah. So catching that sentiment and catching them at that later stage in the buyer's journey, like they know what marketing automation is. They don't need that yeah. A to Z guide from us. They don't need, you know, how to use data and your marketing programs. They probably already know that they probably doing it for years. They just want a better tool that's easier to yeah. use and, and that type of stuff. So yeah. it's really, I think, um, uh, a checklist that works for us, right? We used yeah. a guide to switching solutions, like make sure it can do this, make sure it can do that, make sure it can do this yeah. within mind in the back of my mind, when I'm writing that, that you already have I'm writing down. Well, yeah, I'm the writing down the things that, you that we do have yeah. and I'm writing down the things don't. that suck that they may have, or they suck or like whatever. So I'm leading it's, that horse to yeah. water, even with my checklist. Right. Um, so and so, smart. yeah, I just see it. I, I see that as stacking on top of each other. So you don't uh, need one or the other. You need all of it. You need yeah. the early top of funnel content, like the pillar yeah. page, the blogs, 
uh, the, you know, and video, we informative have content, videos, yeah. Yeah, we, yeah. informative content. And then you need like your checklists and your comparison guides and your pricing sheets and, and like your feature guides and all that kind of stuff later on in the process. So you do need all of that. Um, and I think that it's important for content marketers to plan not only on your ICP, your intended buyer, right. But yeah, also on yeah. that journey. So you're, yeah. you're kind of doing the, who the buyer is and where they are in their journey at every point in the process. Yeah. You know, there's so much to unpack there. You just said, and I'll try to just reiterate a little bit because like, number one, marketing is complicated. Like people, like when I was at the dealership, they just wanted leads. You know what I mean? Like that's all they wanted. Right. That's all they cared about yeah. was leads, but they, and and they just wanted, and, but they didn't understand that we need to like set a foundation and, when, and, I, and all the things you're trying to, you're talking about, I wanted to do, but I was limited from being able to do because they did not understand digital marketing. They didn't understand marketing, let alone digital marketing. And so, for instance, like when I got there, they were driving traffic to empty VDP pages. Oh, sorry. Uh, I don't want to, a VDP is a vehicle detail page. It's like a single product page. And I want to get into car lingo there. Um, and then SRPs are like search results pages of the inventory. And they were driving traffic from Google ads to empty pages that had no pictures, no vehicle descriptions, oh. no video, no nothing. And wondering why they weren't getting any leads. It's like, well, hold I'm on. Picturing here. We got... just money being flushed down the toilet. Oh, totally. <laughs> that's, so that's, flushed that's like, like you wouldn't believe. Burning your money. Apps. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. Um, the oh. amount of money they're flushing down the toilet. It's just, yeah, I won't go. I don't want to get too many details because I don't want to bash them too much. Um, but I was trying to like, the point I'm trying to make is that it's so important to understand the customer journey of who your customer is. And I hear time and time again, and maybe you would we agree with this, is that time and time again, like even big brands, they don't know who their customer persona is. Like I, I'm talking really big brands. I won't name them because I don't want to get sued. But like <laughs> I've talked to people on these episodes and off camera have told me. And um, it's so important. So my question is, is do you think that it's going to become more and more important as marketing gets more and more sophisticated? For businesses, even small business owners, like the contractors, to actually figure out who their customer is and map out the customer journey and work with people like us to actually figure that out and figure the different figure out the different content pieces that need to go into play to maximize. Because you and I both know you can really literally turn a website with content marketing and marketing automation. You can literally turn a website into a 24-7 salesperson. It's it's absolutely I don't even think people realize out there how much that can be done. It's just mind boggling. So I guess, would you agree with that? Like that, that, that those key pieces are going to become more and more important as we move into, into the future. Yeah. I mean, and without it, you're just completely flying blind and just throwing money yeah. all over the place and hoping that you get a customer. And, you know, I, I think that there's a huge, uh, at least from kind of the executive level down, there's like this huge demand for attribution for data on what we're doing, for yeah. information on return on investment, return on that spend. Mm. Hey, we yeah. spent this much on PPC. What was the cost per lead? Like all of those, um, you know, incredibly annoying acronyms that we hear all day long, yeah. right? Like what was yeah. the CPL? Are we doing the PPC? Yeah. Well, how about the MQL yeah. and the yeah. SAL? You're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> come on marketers. Um, we love our acronyms in marketing. Yes, um, but you're not going to be able to answer to the acronym questions if you don't know the customer. Um, and yeah. there's so many tools out there and so much data available now oh, that yeah. if you don't even have the basis for what you're looking for, you have no idea how to apply that data and use that data to grow your business. So yeah. I would say anybody that's here listening that, you know, if you're in doubt about creating a buyer persona or, or writing down who your ideal customer profile is, your ICP, do that yeah. this weekend, do it now because do it now. you're just flying blind and your, your persona is not just, oh, I'll sell anything to anyone. Like that doesn't, if you're going to sell to anyone, let's start to break that down into at least a few categories because yeah. the because behind all of that is people expect immaculate customer experiences right now. They want it yep. to be personalized, segmented. Yep. I want you to know where I am in my journey. I want you to know that yep. I purchased a sweater from you two years ago. Like you, like I want, I want to be seen, right? I mean, don't yeah. we all, right? That's what we started yeah. the episode out with. I got a PhD because I wanted to be seen, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> but on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, we want to be seen. 
by, yeah. by not only friends and family and humans, but by the companies that we, we, we work with. And so if you get the wrong offer at the wrong time, or you oh, just, gosh. this happened to me just last month, right? This is a silly example, but I ordered a little soccer jersey for my four-year-old, right? Super uh-huh. excited to get the first soccer team, the first you know jersey ever. And it was back ordered until after the season was over. So I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to cancel this order. I don't need it. I just, you know, I found a jersey from another mommy, you know, and, and it worked yeah, out yeah. fine. But yeah. a couple of days later, I got a request for a review for that jersey that I never got that I canceled. Oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so oh, I wrote back. Gosh. I actually That's being annoying. a marketer, yeah, being a marketer and kind of a snarky yeah. person. I yep. wrote back and I'm like, you need to have your e-commerce platform talk with your marketing software because yeah. I was actually pretty unhappy that I had to cancel this order and not get my child a and jersey now you for the season. Me off even more. And and now you're asking me for a review. So rather than leaving the one star review, because I mean whatever, it's not the jersey itself, but it's yeah. like those types of things. Well, yeah. you know, if I had a choice, I would never go back to that website ever again um, no, you because of that. And like, yeah. we only have these few moments to talk with and impress our ideal customers. And if yeah. you end up in a situation like that, you've lost them forever. So yeah. should we know our customers? Absolutely. I mean, my answer is hell yeah. yeah. Absolutely. We should. Yeah. Yes. It's not just an exercise. I, it's yeah. the basis for everything. Yeah. Absolutely. And you and I both know that one simple marketing tag would have prevented all of that from happening. Okay. <laughs> all they had to do was create yes, a funnel for that you remove from that and add the tag and it stops that campaign. And there yeah, you let's go. get a little if then logic going on yeah. here, people. Yeah. yeah so exactly. uh, I won't mention exactly. the name of the site, but yeah, it was like something. If, <laughs> That's all right. If, if we don't have to get jerseys from them in the future, I would never shop with them again because of that. And it's like a silly little thing, right? Like most people, okay, whatever. They didn't, they didn't get that I had canceled the order, but um, yeah. knowing, but no, I, and then knowing, knowing your audience too, like knowing that, okay, the soccer season in this town or whatever is at this time. Yeah. So I can't really be back ordered till December because the kids are done playing. Like, so it's yeah. that type of stuff that just made me feel like they did not understand the audience at all. Um, yep. And that's a silly example, but I mean, apply that to your own business and think about how your customers would feel if they experience something like that. Yeah. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to feel very much trust for your brand. It, nope. it makes you look like you don't know what you're doing. Right. So yeah. that's, that's why it's super important. I absolutely totally yeah. agree with you. <laughs> hey, Maya, there are, I think 30 other questions that I wrote that I could ask you, but I see we're coming to the top of the hour. Um, what's one big takeaway you want people to get from this episode? Well, wow, that's one thing that we didn't even really get to. So I'm going to just do okay, one sure. extra point right now. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> because Absolutely. Um, I talked a lot about pillar content and about setting yep. the structure of content for each ICP, right? So that's one thing sure. definitely I want everyone to do. But yep. layering onto that, and it's something that I'm doing right now because I've, I've set the foundation on, in a lot of ways for like, let's say that manufacturing persona that I mentioned. So yep. we've set the foundation in a lot of ways for that. But what we haven't done yet, and which I'm going to do next, is sure. create snackable content from that. Um, uh, you've probably heard a lot lately about zero click content, snackable content. Yeah. Um, don't just post, Hey, we have this new ebook click here. Like yeah. so many B2B businesses, especially do that. And I'm guilty of it myself. Don't even get me yeah. wrong. I know that I've done it lots, but I'm really, I'm really keen on this idea right now of like, let's make a video version of each of those eBooks. Let's yeah. take that video version and chop it down into two minute clips. Let's take that webinar, you know, hour long webinar with some experts and chop that down into, you know, three, five minute clips that give you all the teachings that you want. And it's not just a, yeah. it's not just a preview. It's like the full thought, like the yeah. full teaching, the full thought give it to them on LinkedIn or wherever social media you're at on Twitter, whatever, and just give it. And a lot of people are doing this now. You'll probably see when you go on LinkedIn, it'll be like Peter Caputa from data box does a great job of this. He'll yeah. make a big long post. And it's like with emojis, like number one, two, three, four, five, and gives you this whole teaching of like, this is how we need to do content marketing right now, or this is a problem we solved. And here's the five steps we took to solve it without yeah. clicking on anything. Um, and so we have to get comfortable with that as marketers, right? Because I just said, how much pressure are we facing for attribution of everything we do, right? Like, where's the attribution? You know what? Dark social cannot be attributed. A lot of times somebody will see something like that on social, um, yeah. remember your brand name, and then go to Google and search your brand name. So now yeah. we have organic branded search as the source, but really yeah. it was your podcast. Or really yeah. it was some interview you did where somebody right now is hearing me say work for Act On, and they're like, oh, what's that? They yeah. might search the name act on, but it's not going to be attributed to, you know, Maya Wells, you know, whatever. And this didn't even come yeah. through my current company. So when we yeah. really can't track it. 
So I just, I want everybody to just be aware of the importance of creating snackable, non-click content. Um, you yeah. can even maybe post in the first comment, the link to the thing, or, or yeah. comment if you want me to send you the link or something like that, but you're going to get a lot more reach, especially on LinkedIn right now. LinkedIn is, I mean, not officially, but I think unofficially, right? If you think about it, LinkedIn doesn't want people clicking off of their platform. They want you to scroll no, and don't. scroll and stay on there. Yeah. So if mm-hmm. you're scrolling and scrolling, and also you don't want to take yourself out of that experience. If I'm sitting here on my phone and I'm scrolling on LinkedIn, that's what I want to do. I don't want to click off and fill out your form to get your ebook. So yeah. give me, you know, give me as much information as you can on that post. Don't make me click. And then I'm going to have a really good feeling about your brand and your content. So I'm actually experimenting with that right now. Um, I'm actually making video versions of some eBooks and bringing things down, like quote, like a quote from the eBook on like a slide. And it can be an interactive slideshow, just, just stuff that's more engaging that it's not always just like, Hey, come here and fill out my form. Like people are, do not want that anymore. So yeah, we're just trying to meet people where they're at and give them the nuggets and the, and the cool content that they can just read right there on that platform. No, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. I, uh, like I said, there's there, I, I wanted to respect your time. There's like 30 other questions I could ask you. I'll ask you <laughs> one last question is what do you, what are your thoughts on AI assisted content? That's a hard no for me. Um, I've been pitched a lot on that. Like even from within my own company, which is honestly quite insulting. <laughs> yeah. It's like, why don't you have a robot do your job? It's like, okay. Um, I think that, I will say my main opinion on it is you don't get high quality content that really connects with your yeah. ideal buyer. Um, and our job is not to just pump out content for the sake of pumping out content. It's to pump out yeah. content that actually connects and provides value. So yes, I mean, I've heard of it. I've actually been asked to look into it in certain ways and um, just the quality that you get, I don't think is where we're at as marketers. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's, it's kind of similar to like how old school vinyl DJs think about the new school, like computer playlist DJs. It's like, yeah. it's just not the same craft. And, yeah. you know, for career long writer like myself, it's, it's actually like kind of, kind of insulting when somebody says, Oh, I found this, you know, app that can just write it for you. Um, I think it, it takes away a lot of the art and craft behind writing itself. Yeah. Um, writing is complicated. Holding thing. Yeah. yeah. So I think it, it, it tends to not sound human, you know, and human yeah. is what we want to be, at least in certain brands. Um, and like I said earlier, getting away from the jargon, getting away from the corporate speak. I don't think that's the way to do it. Yeah. Right on. Well, thank you very much for sharing. Um, of course. If our audience wants to connect with you online, how can they do so? That's so Googleable. You can just search Maya Morgan Wells. And my first okay. name is M-A-I-A. Um, okay. A lot of people spell it with a Y. So I just like to clarify. So yeah, just yeah, search me out on LinkedIn. Um, you can get me there. Right on. We'll make sure we put that information in the show notes. And uh, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here. My pleasure.